Okay, great. So there are, Dr. David Keith is one of the few really research oriented academic physicians we know. And David has been as interested in basic science as taking care of patients. I think that's probably been a conflict in your life for most of your life, right? So David is a Harvard University undergraduate. And then he went to, no, no, no. And then he went to Georgetown School of Medicine. I spent a year at Georgetown. Um, and then he went to Northwestern University for postdoc. Yeah, it was for psychiatry. Psychiatry, that's right. That's right, psychiatry residency. Um, and then he went, he was at Yale for a number of years. I'm not too sure doing what, except when he, and then he went to Rhode Island and when he went, was in Rhode Island, he had a laboratory at the Marine Biology Labs at the MBL, did a lot of really interesting work there, some of which I think we're probably gonna hear about this morning and developed an interesting microscope. And then he was recruited to Florida to be a department chair at the University of South Florida. That turned out to not be a hugely popular move with some important person in his world. Um, and so then when an opportunity came back to come to come back to New England, he became chair of OBGYN at New York University, in which he has been for quite a number of years now, maybe 10 years, 12. 12. Um, and so David is with us today. He's going to talk to us about some more of his basic science work. But just remember, this is a very busy clinician who has managed to carve out an entire day for us from his busy clinical schedule. David. Thank you so much, Anne. I'm going to take my mask off once everything clears. I, I just came back for our annual meeting, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, um, uh, where COVID was rife. Everybody was uh, you know, walking around without masks. There were a few with masks. And my wife and I were both, oh, how quaint, oh, how retro to wear a mask. And then first she got it, and then I got it. Although I think I'm out the other end now because um, I feel I feel much better than I sound. I sort of sound like, uh, you know, the Godfather. You know, you come to me the day of my daughter's wedding. Can you hear me okay? Is it all right? Okay, and uh, I'm on my, uh, I've completed a full course of uh, Paxlovir, so I should be non-infectious. We're still social distancing. Um, thank you so much uh, for the invitation to come here. I, I've been to a number of these meetings and not one have I ever left without learning something really new. And I particularly appreciated the end's perspective. Um, George Santiana spoke the truth when he said those who do not read history. And, and so much of this keeps coming back in circles. Um, and it's so wonderful to have Dave Albertini here. Dave has been the light uh, in the darkness that's uh, the pall that's cast over our field now that you may have, I'm American, I love capitalism, but Wall Street has discovered what they call the IVF space. So we're at our annual scientific meeting, at least 50% of the activity was on who's merging with whom, what's their margin, what's their new patient to IVF cycle conversion rate. Again, you know, it's America, it's cool. But with all this, it's sort of, uh, in the end, uh, about patients and uh, and, and about the science that underlies it. So no disclosures. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, the profound genomic instability, uh, including with a number of forms of aneuploidy, mosaicism, copy number variants that arises in pre-implantation embryos. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on telomeres for a little bit. That's how, what I've been working on for the last 15 years. Um, and then uh, you'll see some work that we've done many years ago showing a robust telomere elongation during early embryo development, one that's independent of telomerase. It occurs in parthenotes. Um, and um, we're going to propose the possibility this may involve a regulation of transcription to, uh, through the so-called telomere position effect known to Trisophocam, the geneticists for decades. And then um, part of this you'll see involves activation of retrotransposons. Uh, and, and does this reshape the embryos, the genome, to give it an additional genetic diversity in the process. So um, 
clinicians in the group, um, hopefully none of you have been patients to have to experience the reality that during uh, uh, human reproduction, we do a lot of uh, IVF in our center, about almost 4,900 cycles a year. Uh, we do a lot of genetic testing and it's remarkable, remarkable how profound genomic instability is when we do this uh, tofectoderm biopsy and submit it to pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy. We, we find an age-related increase in the probability of aneuploidy. Um, and you can see that um, when we do not do genetic testing, the extensive reduction in uh, probability of conception in SARS, just our society's registry, um, is uh, massive such that by early 40s, which is to me the sort of the new 30s, especially in midtown Manhattan, uh, it's astounding these incredibly fit women who, you know, eat all the right stuff way better than I, uh, are uh, finding that their embryos are almost universally aneuploid and completely non-viable. And uh, when we test and find a euploid embryo, separating the wheat from the shaft, finding that needle in the haystack, even then a high proportion of those fail, suggesting that, uh, let me pull this up so it gets in. such that the uh, begs the question, what other factors contribute to this reproductive failure in the setting of the of, a, of an em of euploid embryos transfer? And but since then, a number of studies, especially as after we introduced next generation sequencing as our method, preferred method for analyzing the chill factor term DNA, we found uh, at first to the chagrin of many who thought it was going to be easy, we found uh, a very extensive mosaicism uh, but not just mosaicism, a copy number variants. Um, yeah, others have gone on to find indels, uh, single nucleotide variants. Uh, as you probably know, China has jumped headfirst into uh, this field uh, as they first watched their uh, population increase decline. Now their actual population is decreasing. They've invested heavily in well, not only clinical IVF, but also uh, translational research and basic research in a paper published out of the Third People's Women's Hospital in Beijing uh, some years ago, reported uh, um, the whole genome sequencing of human embryos that were ostensibly euploid and found all of these mosaicism. They found a copy number variants, indels, uh, which suggests that these are uh, just markers of a, of a global genomic instability. Here are one of the many reports showing copy number variants are rife within human embryos. So some years ago, um, you know, as a clinician, uh, you get hit every day with this aging effect. It, it trumps everything. A patient, we have the guy who invented ICSI, the infantized cytoplasmic sperm injection with us here, Gian Perro, Palermo. We all use his procedure, but even then a patient comes and says, oh, you know, my own problem, my only problem is my husband has no sperm. Um, we have some of his testicle, presumably, but the single best predictor of whether she goes home with a baby actually relates to her own age. So as this aging effect uh, became more and more prominent, I've targeted this for my own work like 25 years ago. Uh, and a lot of the papers that have come out uh, will knock out, say, co genes from code cohesions. And lo and behold, you get, um, you get, uh, premature chromatid separation, and they'll knock out this or that. Uh, but very little, it, it was really able to elucidate the issue of aging. Where, where does time fit in? So when Maria Blasco and uh, Carol Kreider published this paper in Nature in the 1990s, showing an aging effect of telomerase null mice on multiple axes, but including the reproduction, it was sort of hidden you know, in the midst of their results section. I immediately called Maria, who had just moved to Spain, and uh, pitched her with the idea that maybe this is having some impact on the uh, so-called reproductive aging effect. And uh, so we collaborated. Uh, we used their telomerase null mice. Uh, and uh, here are some of the results that we found. Just to uh, kind of recap for those who don't think about telomeres, they're tandem repeats in metazones, it's TTATG, that um, uh, are associated with six proteins uh, that form a complex. It's called sheltering because it kind of shelters the uh, chromosome ends where they cap and protect them. Uh, and they fall here, you can see, into a loop called a T-loop or telomere loop, uh, and thus uh, avoid the detrimental effects of uh, 
uh, of uh, DNA and um, strands that would trigger otherwise a DNA damage response. Uh, and uh, loss of these repeats occurs uh, with each cell division and probably not quite as understood in the field of reproduction also with aging and non-dividing cells through uh, DNA damage effects on their guanine-rich sequence, which leads to deoxyguanine, excision repair, and uh, telomeric uh, attrition to that. Telomerase reversed with scriptase uh, can... Uh, can actually uh, reprieve some of the, uh, the effects of loss. Um, but as you see in a little bit, in the early embryo, actually telomerase is heavily repressed, uh, suppressed, um, and an alternative lengthening of telomerase, of telomeres takes hold. Uh, interestingly, uh, it's now increasingly clear that actually telomeres and their associated telomerase are actually kind of a special case of transposons. Um, both, uh, for example, telomeres express uh, a non-coding uh, RNA, TIRA, which is a, it's a telomere reverse, it's a RNA. And uh, they have the reverse transcriptase activities, which is uh, telomerase. Uh, and uh, some species, for example, uh, Drosophila melanogaster, uh, use transposon repeats uh, to protect their telomere ends, suggesting that they're there may actually be a convergence biologically. So just this is sort of the, the, uh, the, the classic understanding of how telomere attrition promotes uh, genomic instability as the telomere goes through attrition through uh, cell cycles or in, uh, in non-dividing cells through uh, exposure to the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, the inevitable oxidative damage that occurs you get in the end uncapping and you get telomere fusions. Uh, and uh, John uh, Mesjajowski now at uh, Sloan Carey had been uh, at Tissier Delang's lab had also shown that it promotes a, a, a very unique uh, cell pathology called chrom chromothripsis, uh, which can end uh, with the copy number variants in the indel, suggesting that this mechanism alone can explain much of what goes on. He did most of this in cultured cells. So as we move back into the interest, uh, cell of interest, the cell, the uh, oocytes and early embryos, interestingly, in oocytes, in pre-blastocyst uh, stage embryos, telomerase activity is very, very low uh, and uh, only restarts uh, during uh, the transition to blastocyst and mainly in the inner cell mass. Uh, this comes from the work of uh, Woody Wright uh, and Jerry Shays uh, in, in, in Dallas and has been replicated. This was in human, and we show the same in mouse, suggesting there's a very different biology there. Um, so we uh, used uh, Carol Greider and Ray Blasco's model, this telomerase null mice, to solve a, a sort of a technical problem in mice. As those of you who, who study aging, reproductive aging in mice are probably aware, the major locus of reproductive aging in most strains of mice is not the oocyte, unlike the human. In the human, if you take a 40-year-old woman and you give her a 20-year-old egg, she's got the 20-year-old's fertility. In a mouse, it, the, the major locus of aging, what ages before the oocytes, is the, the uterus and the brain. The hypothalamus uh, has a uh, found uh, neurodegenerative effect that maybe is estrogen dependent. So, so uh, interestingly, the telomeres in the mice are about 10 to 20 times longer than humans. So by using Carol Greider and uh, Ray Belasco's model across generations, the telomere, uh, telomeres undergo attrition. And as the telomere length in a mouse approaches that of humans, they phenocopy the reproductive aging response uh, that one sees uh, in humans. Uh, and this explains a number of phenomena. Uh, when I gave a telomere related lecture many years ago, uh, when Bob Edwards was still alive, he ran up to me afterwards and said, that's it. And I said, what's it? Uh, he had proposed uh, back in the 60s, the so-called production line hypothesis and then tested it. The production line hypothesis is, as you know, during fetal life, uh, mouse, human, um, primates, uh, 
Oh, with Genesis, a curse, a replicative of, uh, replication of the Oliconia occurred during a narrow, narrow window in the human between 10 and 20 weeks gestation. Uh, and by 20 weeks, they ventured meiosis, stopped dividing, uh, and then arrest, and they wait. And by the way, about 60% of the oocytes undergo attrition before birth even. And what Bob had shown, same thing happens in the mouse, of course, the window is much smaller. He showed through uh, a number of labeling methods that um, the first oocytes to leave the oligonial proliferation were the uh, first to ovulate in the, an adult. And he did this through very clever experimental manipulation using ovarian transplant, ovarian cultures. And the last oocytes to have formed from the late replicating uh, oligonia were the last to ovulate. It, it, it's, it's a remarkable feat of experimental virtuosity, uh, but several others afterwards replicated it. It's not just uh, Henderson and Edwards, at least three or four other groups. And then it just kind of fell on dead ears because what does that mean? <laughs> and he didn't have a cellular mechanism even to understand how even that might work. And then along comes the telomeres decades later that suggests a, a clock. There's a replication clock, which may well be uh, extended into other forms of aging, even in replication independent. Um, Terry uh, Hushold had uh, demonstrated, as many others, that a major driver of non-destruction in humans is decreased chiasma to decreased synapsis uh, in oocytes of older women. And we published uh, many years ago, uh, with my colleague uh, Lin Lu, uh, a uh, study using the telomerase knockout bombs showing that uh, the uh, reduction of telomere length through these experimental manipulations available with the telomerase no mouse and um, aging them over time, uh, decreased telomeres are associated with decreased chiasmata and decreased synapsis and in fact, uh, Subsequently, a number of other groups in a kind of reversal of fortune here. We reported this first in mouse, and then the yeast people jumped in this. So when we go to the telomer and telomerase meeting in Cold Spring Harbor, there's a dozen talks about uh, the so-called bouquets and how telomeres set up meiosis. They set up the chiasmata in multiple species, including uh, uh, vision yeast, mouse, human. Uh, and then... Um, Dave Battaglia had reported spindle dysmorphologies in oocytes from older women. And uh, we published an EMBO some years ago, uh, uh, reports of the marked spindle abnormalities that arise in these uh, experimental model for aging. Uh, and then we showed um, a, a fragmentation and apoptosis in these. Um, all this is great in mouse, but what about humans? It's a little hard to do these experiments in humans, but sometimes God or Darwin, whoever uh, sets these things up, gives you a uh, a little um, uh, possibility here. This was a woman referred to us by NIH, the uh, Rare Disease Center, where uh, she was identified as having, this is literally her, and I'm sorry I didn't put her uh, little tape over her face, but she's from Sweden and uh, was 30 years old um, in this picture and was 20 years old in this picture. And we've used, this is, um, she has a telomeropathy, telomeropathy, uh, this one is called dyskeratosis congenita. It's a, 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 a mutation encoding one of the shelterins or uh, one of the other proteins involved in telomere, telomere maintenance. Her telomeres were less than first percentile uh, for someone her age. She, she, she looked great, except she looked like she was 60, even though she was 30. And um, she came to us because she was healthy enough anyway at that time to want to try to preserve her fertility. There have been early indications that they have a whole special unit now that studies um, telomeropathies. They develop, not, not surprisingly, bone marrow failure, eventually pulmonary fibrosis, but uh, their group had also shown depletion of iron reserves. So she came to uh, preserve what function she had. And you can see uh, someone between 29 and 31 in our center has a anti-mullerian hormone marker of ovarian reserve, um, somewhere to one to three, and hers was 10 times lower than that. Uh, we used a huge amount of medication and got um, a fraction of the number of oocytes we would normally um, achieve, and interestingly, the vast majority, but not all, were aneuploid. Um, 
which begs the question, how would you, with telomeres less than 1% of uh, normal, how would you even imagine that? Uh, well, this is the other uh, fascinating things that occurs with telomeres during early development, in that they elongate even in the setting of uh, almost no telom measurable telomerase activity, uh, even in the setting of depressed turrets, you know, transcription, uh, the, the telomere, tel the telomere reverse transcriptase. Uh, through a, an alternative lengthening method. This is many years old now, uh, where we looked in mice. Uh, and uh, you, you can see, as in humans, the telomeres are quite short, quite small. You can see the M2O sites. Uh, but they elongate. Um, here you can see in the, the telomerase, the kinetics of telomerase is it typically adds somewhere between 50 to 100 base pairs per cell cycle. These are kilobase elongations, kilobase elongations. Now, many could argue, you know, those, and I'm sure Oliver will discuss this in mice. Uh, interestingly, as well in humans, telomeres in men are very long. Uh, they're actually among the longest telomeres in the body uh, in humans, uh, and they elongate with age. Uh, interesting question. How, how does that occur? Because telomerase, the kinetics are such that it's hard to explain extensive elongation uh, from the modest elongation you get. And in addition, they occur, this telomere elongation occurred even in parthenos, as you can see, uh, even in these uh, parthenos, you're, you're getting this massive elongation. Uh, and in telomerase null mice, you see the same. Here you can see these different uh, generations after the telomerase knockout, G1 and G3 in uh, each stage, you can see an elongation even without telomerase present. What about women? Um, this work comes from Nate Treff, who's a very bright translational uh, geneticist, first at RMA and now with his own business, and reported along with Richard Scott, uh, telomere elongation in humans. He used the polar body because he wanted to have each cell be its own control. Um, we showed the same thing. This is a PhD who finally, uh, seven years after he did the work, published it in Genes this year. Same thing where there's this extensive telomere elongation that occurs even in humans. Um, we also found uh, parthenotes, human parthenotes, uh, elongating their telomeres, suggesting it's not just the, the telomerase reverse transcriptase. So oh, what's this, what's the, what could be the function of such robust telomere elongation that appears to be conserved? It's conserved between, at least between mice uh, and humans and others have shown in um, primates as well which introduces the possibility, and this is still a uh, hypothesis, that uh, something called the telomere position effect may be at play, just to kind of remind me, remind you of this. This is first reported in fly, uh, where these transposons uh, can affect um, the heterochromatin uh, in the subtelomeric region. There are a number of different forms um, by directly affecting heterochromatin. Then there's the so-called classic, where uh, the effect depends on the length of the telomere itself, uh, presumably uh, in the third case, this looping back can actually extend well into the subtelomeric region, where now what we're talking about is transcription. And uh, as an aside, I'm sure many of us who lived through the uh, first announcements of the human genome, uh, uh, again, I was junior enough that to me it was all new, but Many were aghast to find that humans had roughly the same number of genes as flies and mice and worms and, and zebrafish. Uh, and it, it's very clear now that much of evolution, and I think most of us, in some, I guess if you look at Washington, you may question this, but there has been some evolution of the human species. We've done a few things right, probably control the earth for good or bad, at least biologically we've evolved. And probably much of that is coming through um, through regulation of expression. The same genes are being regulated in much finer tubes. So presumably evolution is acting not just on gene sequence, but also gene function. The folks that do the expression of QTLs are doing this. So we became very interested in retrotransposons because of the following. There's a disease. As a clinician, I, I believe patients more than anybody or anything. Um, clinical syndromes, are hard to, um, to miss. Uh, and there's a disease called um, fascio-scapulohumeral muscular dystrophy. Um, and uh, 
this has been uh, held out as a sine qua non of the telomere position effect previously proposed mainly in flies and some in mice, but as an example where this actually may affect human beings. And what happens here is that with age, uh, folks carrying this gene uh, mutation develop a very unique pattern of, of muscular failure, which the name, the fascia, uh, the you know, face, scapula, and humeral regions are affected first. Uh, and subsequently, there's been a fascinating, fairly complex genetics worked out where ducks, we'll get into this in a second, ducks is a gene that is very important early in development to encode the so-called central role. It's a major player in the so-called two-cell effect, uh, two-cell stage where totipotency is achieved by the pretty differentiated egg and sperm. There are multiple copies of this, uh, and the disease involves mutations uh, and a number of factors that control their expression. It's normally turned off. Dux is turned off uh, after the two-cell uh, stage of development and remains off. But uh, turns out in people with this uh, FSHD, it gets unsuppressed. Uh, so it gets reactivated. Uh, and uh, Woody Wright and Jerry Shea uh, identified uh, a, an effect of telomere length on this process. The telomeres, it turns out, do regulate heterochromatin in the genes that are regulating ducts uh, in this model system. So it's kind of a, a reversal um, of what had happened early in development, which then, from the standpoint of somebody interested in early development, uh, places a uh, uh, bright light on this process. Just to remind folks the two cell genes, uh, they're growing in number, but uh, these uh, regulate the totally potential state. Uh, remember, you think of Embryonic stem cells as pluripotential, potential, but they cannot make placenta to affect the derm membranes. But the totally potential state, uh, which occurs in mice around the two cell stage, hence the, the term two cell genes, and in humans is more complex, but probably involves the four to eight cell stages of development, um, it, it are mediated through uh, ducts, uh, ducts four, it's ortholog, uh, humans with. Uh, a number of other genes, including Z-Scan4, and most recently, this one called Elf, N -Elf, N -N -N -Alpha. Uh, and uh, a small proportion of embryonic stem cells in culture also will intermittently, transiently express these two cell genes, which apparently is able to extensively elongate telomeres, not, not, not the 50 to 100 base pair elongation you get with telomerase, but rather uh, we'll shift it into this sort of high gear. And um, in this work uh, by Junju Huang, who's actually one of my postdocs, who's now a state key investigator, he was actually the first guy to use, to use uh, CRISPR Cas9 in humans, but, but not, you don't hear about him because he didn't put the embryos back. He showed there was a lot of off target effect, he didn't get any press, but he's a brilliant guy. Sun Yat Sen um, was able to show that. Uh, that um, this totally potential state is involved in a number of uh, transposable elements, which we'll get into a little bit more in this. So retrotranspose on this issue? No, and, uh, and as usual, we have a very clear insight into this. Um, these are... Uh, a number of sequences that are highly repetitive. They comprise about 40% of the human genome. Um, they presumably, I think probably Anne's assessment is probably more on, on par. We don't know for sure, but the presumption is that at some point uh, they or their ancestors infected our ancestral genome. M most of these have been inactivated through acquisition of mutations that render their uh, transposition activity uh, inactive, uh, but but one category class uh, long interspersed nuclear elements um, retain at least in the human uh, retrotransposon activity. Uh, but fifty to hundred copies, of mainly the uh, evolutionarily youngest, appear to be still capable 
of jumping. They encode proteins with reverse transcriptase and endonuclease activities. Uh, and then they can insert randomly, um, particularly during certain stages for the bulk of one's life, number of epigenetic um, alterations keep them quiescent. Uh, but during certain uh, windows, early development, and interestingly, as John Sedevy and Brown showed, as we age, the protective effects of these uh, of DNA methylation, histone methylation, change epigenetic uh, marks are um, withdrawn, and we have activation. Um, this just shows you what a prototypical line one gene looks like with the, the two open reading frames one encoding an endonuclease activity and the other a reverse transcription activity. This is from a lovely review by Kathy Burns, who's now here in Boston. Um, and there are a number of mechanisms that I'm sure we're going to hear more about this from Oliver's talk, where there's been um, a number of strategies evolved uh, to suppress the activation uh, in humans in particular of line one uh, and protect against genomic instability. Uh, peewees, the, uh, the, the pi RNA pathways, DNA methylation, uh, and some of the others. I'm not going to focus too much on this. Uh, but what's interesting, this comes from the group in, uh, uh, at Cambridge, uh, this, this graph here, uh, during comedogenesis and early development, there's a, a resetting of the genome. Um, much of the, of the code that is um, allowing differentiation uh, has to be wiped free in order to reach that toady potential state and eventually allow a resetting, a re beginning, a rejuvenation, a rebirth uh, of the genome along with the, the child. Uh, and um, you can look at days post uh, early development here, the male genome in blue, broken, and the female genome in pink. Um, you can see they both undergo uh, a uh, marked demethylation, although at different rates involving different enzymes uh, versus passive, uh, and then they reacquire uh, the methylation. And again, these are only part of the story. The rest involving uh, changes in, uh, in uh, histones. Uh, and among these, uh, line one uh, is extensively silenced by methylation of cytosine and histones in these islands where they congregate, um, but they're demethylated, reset uh, during early development. Uh, interestingly, and we're not going to talk about this stage of development, but uh, the group at uh, Carnegie some years ago showed that um, that massive attrition uh, in uh, oocytes, that uh, primordial follicles that occurs after the cessation of uh, oogenesis before birth results from activation of line one. And by blocking this with AZT, he was able to. Uh, abrogate the effects of uh, fetal oocyte attrition, showing that this is a very, very important um, ubiquitous process that needs uh, uh, controlling, needs mechanisms. So this actually comes from a paper that Oliver was a co-author of. I'm sure he's familiar with this. It's a really was an inspiration to us where they looked at mouse pre-implantation and embryo development in Line one, this one that remains in humans, at least uh, very active and also in mouse, it's highly expressed in early mouse embryos. We found a similar parallel uh, profile of expression in, in humans. Uh, they decrease, especially between the so called two cell stage and then the subsequent stages of eight cell. Um, they manipulated the expression of uh, endogenous line one using transcription activator like effector, these tails. And perturbation uh, of the line one transcription with the tails impaired the development of the embryo. Blocking uh, the reverse transcriptase, on the other hand, the AZT, at least in this model, had no effective development. So um, it, it appears that this embryo rest that occurs is independent of the retrotransposed position itself. Uh, similarly, the uh, injection of other uh, mouse or uh, human line ones. Uh, didn't uh, interfere unless it was early in, uh, in uh, the two cell stage. So this is a very important stage dependent effect. Uh, and then they went on to discuss the various effects of, of, of these uh, chromatin uh, decondensation and recondensation that occurs during the geno genomic activation. 
So we've been very interested in that and uh, looking at, uh, again, in a, a mouse model, uh, we found that um, we could uh, alter the uh, uh, extension, the elongation of telomeres by uh, per perturbing uh, the, um, the line one retrotransposal. Here, we used AZT. And this appeared to be uh, cell cycle dependent. Again, this is a two cell stage in the mouse. Uh, in the S to G2 phase, we saw a very significant reduction in the telomere elongation that occurs um, during this time in a very reducible way. Uh, but AZT was able to inhibit this, suggesting at least in this model with this particular phenotype of telomere elongation, it appears to be dependent on retrotransposition. Uh, and in addition, if we look at line one expression, it seemed to go down, which would be surprising given uh, what we're doing. Uh, we also uh, showed that um, the expression of a number of uh, factors that are important during this stage, not only line one, but also the ducts, the Z scan four, the, these two, two of the most central uh, two cell genes that are regulating this important stage of development. Uh, is also, they are also affected. And again, in this stage, in stage cell cycle dependent way, where you can see AZT had very profound effects on Z-scan4, on uh, ducts, uh, as did, uh, it did on line one. We also showed that uh, the line one um, open reading frame one protein, the, in other words, the protein level of this uh, and, and Z-scan4 both co-localized with telomeres in early mouse development. And you can see the arrows are showing the, the two uh, um, uh, epifluorescence markers that are overlapping. Um, subsequently, uh, my uh, former postdoc, a different former postdoc, Lin Lu, who's a long-term collaborator, um, picked up this and he, there's only, only so much you could do with human embryos, even with the brilliant technical skills of our top mammalian embryologist. Uh, he used, uh, a, a cultured model where we take uh, tissues that are from uh, uh, telomerase null, uh, meaning short telomere over time, their telomeres undergo attrition in wild type with long telomeres, uh, cultured the cells, uh, used tissues, and compared the, tra the transcriptome uh, using RNA seq, uh, the whole genome sequencing to look for uh, alterations and in, uh, integrity. Uh, and then did an epigenome analysis. And um, some of the take-homes from this are he was able to find once again, that in this model with the telomerase null tissues, the same sort of profound effect. Uh, these are looking at relative expression of Z-scan4, um, OC4 and nano. Um, and again, very similar activation of retrotransposons and effect on uh, in the same. Interestingly, um, there's a busy uh, slide here, sorry, but you can see here uh, uh, some evidence for telomere position effect. So if you look at uh, early telomerase knockout mice where their telomeres are still pretty intact, approaching wild type versus late where they're very short, and you look at the relative expression of each of these um, uh, retro elements, you can see uh, major effects there and then uh, the closer the, there are many copies of most of these, and the closer the gene is to the telomere, the bigger the effect. So if you look at 20 megabases out, there's not much of an effect. Um, so this is the conclusion of their recently published paper uh, that is uh, uh, pretty consistent with the, the group from Munich that Molly was part of. Uh, and uh, I'm going to wrap it up with this last uh, couple of slides. Uh, a question, uh, remember earlier we discussed the profound clinical finding that uh, even in the setting of a euploid embryo transfer, still 40% or so of embryos fail. Either they do not implant or they implant uh, and then miscarry. So could there be other things going on? One wonders, um, because line one, the expression early in development, when you think about it, becomes almost like a mutagenesis experiment. Uh, there's this massive release of these um, uh, these uh, active retrotransposons uh, in a setting with relatively open chromatin. Uh, and again, this is from the same review of Kathy Burns, 
uh, a number of different ways one can imagine in which retrotransposition could alter the genome. One is through um, insertions in exons, given that exons represent less than 1% of the genome, that's probably the least likely, although she and some of her colleagues have identified transmissible genetic uh, diseases that have presumably arisen when a line one or an alley, which can be carried in on the uh, on the kind of the backdraft of, of line one's retrotransposition, um, have inserted into a key part. Uh, there are some examples of de novo BRCA1 and BRCA2, BRCA2 mutations where uh, they explain on the basis of a new insertion, still relatively rare. But one could also imagine a way uh, in which it could affect exonization uh, and the uh, uh, and the way that the uh, the gene is spliced in, and finally, in expression itself. And this is a very active area of research in the retrotransposon, particularly early in development. This marked effect of uh, evolution in, in the absence of huge amounts of uh, alteration uh, in in, uh, in the genes encoding proteins themselves. They're somewhat constrained by function. But it appears to be that evolution has worked on regulation of genes. And uh, she and others, many of them in the field, are looking at the effects of uh, looking at the uh, promoter and enhancer effects of, of, uh, of the um, uh, alteration of the genome by in insertion of, of uh, active retrotransposition. Uh, so Kathy and her group had developed something called transposon insertion profiling sequencing. It uses this uh, strategy. One of the problems with short read sequencing, looking at uh, the repetitive sequences, you get 300 MERS, and you're trying to figure out whether um, this is just uh, uh, normal or abnormal. And uh, as uh, it's been explained by a number of people that when you do short read sequencing, you, know, you sort of fragment the uh, the crossword puzzle into little pieces, and then you try to assemble it back. And it's easy when you see a, a you know, a, 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 pic, a part of the picture is the Boston Comet. That one you can put in. And but when you hit the blue sky, that's the repetitive se se segments of the genome. It's harder. So they used a very clever approach where they provide uh, information uh, of the surrounding genome. And uh, she published that and uh, some years ago in uh, uh, PNAS and. We helped her identify uh, a method to be able to do this at a single cell level. We do the single cell work. And um, so we developed a so-called single cell tip sequencing and have applied this to human genomes to tackle the question directly, experimentally, are there novel de novo line one mutations that are altering the genome of human embryos that are otherwise uh, normal? Uh, and this is work still in progress. This is an example of some of the data, the vast majority of uh, line ones that we identify have already been reported in this work. Uh, we just, we used uh, sort of historic controls, encode some of the, there's some actually, some, there are various line one uh, registries of different uh, variants, uh, but you can see there are a small number of de novo, or I shouldn't say de novo because we don't know that yet, they're unknown. So what we're doing right now is we've got trios um, and we're uh, identifying whether these were private uh, variants or whether they were uh, actually true, uh, true, true de novo mutations. And the idea is eventually uh, track them and look at the function of the embryo. So just to wrap it up and thank you for your attention. I know we have skipped through a lot of different things, but um, the link between telomeres and vector transposons is not just in the vector, the, the, the reverse transcriptase is part of the, of the uh, telomerase, but also in a wider sense, um, there's this extensive kilobase related elongation during zygotic activation found both in humans and mouse and uh, monkey. And uh, it occurs um, at a stage that's very critical, the mouse, the two cell stage, uh, and it involves uh, a number of genes uh, that are both regulating uh, the two cell genes and the two cell genes are regulating them. Uh, and uh, mounting evidence suggests this is involving extensive mo uh, modulation of the chromatin uh, state, especially in the subtelomeric regions where these critical developmental genes are located, including ducts, ducts 4 
Uh, and then this is really a question at the end, uh, do these line one insertions then turn around and enter the re-enter the genome and provide uh, a, uh, another form of genetic diversity, which is a major driver of evolution. So um, this great group, I've been lucky to collaborate with a number of folks at, uh, at NYU, including Jeff Boca, and David Fanio, and Kathy Burns, uh, now in Boston, uh, as well as all our team there. Thank you for your attention. In fact, the questions? Yeah, can you go back to the other slide? Thanks, David. I have I have one question. Actually, I have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I don't want to all the time. What does the telomere extension? What does that do in an early age? Okay, this is on one of the my hypothesis is that um, drawing from the inspiration of this unique form of muscular dystrophy is that um, it's regulating sub subtelomere uh, chromatin and the expression of subtelomere genes that are essential for development. So, so uh, let me step back. I would say where we started with this is we kind of assumed that most of it would relate to non disjunction and employee copies of the variants, chromophytes like uh, uh, those early slides of the post. And we're continuing looking at that. Um, but in addition, we're asking, finding some evidence that it may also regulate transcription of, of really the critical genes, the developmentally essential genes. And again, this is work in progress. It's, not over yet. Thank God. So, maybe if, if I may, so the short, if I understand correctly, the short term means. Do you need a microphone? I think, I think it's again? okay. Okay. Talk loud. So, if the short term is a trigger in the end, and the other end is a trigger, the allocation of the of the domain. So, the canon, that's fascinating. So, if you figure out that system, in, in, in adults, we were able to do it forever for longer. Uh, yeah, so um, great question. So, just to repeat it, you said in the early embryo, uh, the short tail embryos um, are triggering the elongation of the um, uh, of the tail embryos, this robust elongation. And so, I think the implication of that is we should, as we shorten our tail embryos, why wouldn't we live forever? Uh, and that's a great question. And I think the answer to that is actually provided by nature. It, it, the experiment was done in, in the case of, um, of uh, this unusual muscular dystrophy. Um, that, uh, that, that process, telomere elongation, the so-called two-cell effect, really matters. You know, you know, in real estate, it's like location, location, location. And uh, in development, it's context, context, context. And in, uh, early development, the appropriate telomere elongation appears to be essential. It appears to be uh, regulated by retrotransposons and retrotransposons in turn regulate it, but at the wrong time in the wrong place, it's not a good thing to, to be you know, kind of colloquial. For, for example, uh, with that uh, muscular dystrophy, the telomere attrition does unleash the, the duct's uh, expression, which is, stage inappropriate, it's developmentally inappropriate. And actually, I refer you back to the paper by the Dallas group. They show in you know, very extensive work where how that happens. They have myoblasts and they culture them and they show how this totally potential gene uh, uh, exposed to myoblasts or exposing it to myoblasts promotes uh, muscular dystrophy. So, so much depends on, and I'm sure we're going to hear more about this on the current epigenetic state, uh, which adds to the complexity. Uh, what was that? I think it was H.L. Mencken that said all models are wrong, but some are helpful. And and he said that most uh, models are, are wrong. That's the emphasis. Is that is the, 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 it is complex, but uh, you know it's we have to let the nature teach us before we simplify. So the answer to that is doesn't seem to happen. As healing nutrition does not appear to help us live forever. It appears to be the opposite. Uh, telomeres do still undergo attrition over time. Um, for example, not to spook anybody, but the single best predictor 
of um, lasting through a year at a, a retirement home is the telomere length of the residence. <laughs> so at the end of our lives, uh, telomeres depend, apparently profoundly affect our robustness. Another study from Montefiore showed that um, there's a subgroup, uh, they particularly looked at the elderly Ashkenazi Jewish population of the Bronx, where they're, they're in that neighborhood, um, that there was uh, among uh, super centenarians, those that got over 100 years old, uh, that they had a very high proportion of mutated or variants, gene variants in the gene encoding, uh, the, the, the regulated subunit of telomerase that promoted telomere elongation. So uh, it's pretty complex. Um, of those interested in IVF, a paper just came out in Nature Medicine about four months ago from China that looked at a population database of babies born from, from IVF uh, versus uh, natural conception. And interestingly, and actually somewhat disturbingly, the telomeres in the babies born from IVF uh, were significantly shorter and represented about 10 to 15 years of aging, uh, which is fascinating uh, consideration of importance, not only for developmental biology or parthenogenesis, or it's actually a public health concern. And they're concerned about that in, in China, we should be here too. And in Europe, there's four to 5% uh, babies now being born from IVF kind of is important, you know, whether that's real or not. We're trying to replicate that using our own um, database. Uh, we, we have uh, cord blood from babies born from IVF or not to see how early that begins. Yeah. Well, we actually do need them. They can't do it at all. Yeah. Okay. We, we should have one. Are people complaining to you? Yeah. <laughs> they can't hear the questions being asked. Yeah. Well, we can ask, also ask those. I'll make sure. Yeah. Questions. Yeah, I think that the, the, the exchange probably would be best. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'm sort of following up on the middle of your answer to that last question, uh, which is, do you have any idea if people know why duct expression in a myoblast, the con context, 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 why is it a problem in a myoblast and not in the blasting here? Um, do people have any idea what the, you know, can you do an overexpression screen in ES cells to look for things that make ducts overexpression bad or do a knockdown screen in myoblasts to see what will prevent it from being a problem for myoblasts? So what is, what is content? Yeah, that's a really important question. And um, I suspect that the kind of work that you help, you know, tackle that, I, I, uh, I think it's uh, fascinating, and it, it actually uh, extends beyond just a specific example of doctrine early development in maturation, but to the very uh, one of the core questions in, uh, in uh, epigenomics, which is uh, why does a certain state in one setting uh, do X and in another setting it does Y? I don't know. <laughs> Great question. There was an online question. Um, what is the trigger for telomere elongation? Is it part of a general phenomenon, e.g. several metabolic functions are suppressed in oocytes, or is there a specific mechanism that may be specific for telomeres? Okay, so the question there is, what's triggering this telomere, telomere elongation? Um, the short answer is, that, I don't know. <laughs> I can give you a little bit more context, though. Um, it's quite rare, quite rare in... Um, in life to see this. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually got a, uh, it's a broad rubric called alternative lengthening of telomeres. And it actually, it's fascinating how it was first discovered. Uh, you can imagine, you know, when the telomere telomere story first evolved, everybody thought this was the magic bullet for, for treatment of cancer because of nine, depending on what type of cancer, most epithelial cancers, 95, 96% express telomeres. Uh, and, uh, so the idea was, and, and, and yet in adult cells, it's actually quite rare to see expression of telomerase. There, there are certain cells, gut cells, endometrial cells, where there's still adult progenitor cells that have some, not pluripotential, but they have some replicative uh, capacity. Uh, and But most adult cells do not express telomerase. So um, the thought was, uh, the whole company was set up with the idea of finding telomerase inhibitors. And if we found the telomerase inhibitor, we cure cancer with very few side effects because very few cells actually depend on it in an adult, in a human. And uh, so 
they went through screens, they screened, you know how they do these things, these brute force, they looked at um, every kind of compound they could find in. Among them, the, the libraries was a library of 55 uh, canonical uh, traditional Chinese medicine uh, compounds. And one of them was known in traditional Chinese medicine to promote longevity and help fertility. It's interesting. And, and yet, you know, they're screening for, remember, telomerase inhibitors. And what they found was a telomerase activator. And like, oh, who would want that? You know, that, that causes cancer. And actually, there's pretty growing evidence that it may slightly increase. Most of us initially thought it wasn't, but there's growing evidence that big Danish epidemiological studies showed that you know, there are genetic variants. Uh, and those with a predisposition to longer telomeres you think would live longer, but actually they also have more rate of cancer. So it isn't quite so simple. But at that time, they were not interested. So but an astute businessman said, wow, you know, who happened to be older said, hmm, you know, it's a Chinese herb. Like, you know, this doesn't need FDA approval. It's it, so he licensed it. You can buy it. It's called TA65. I take it every day and I'm 103. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> It actually is incredibly expensive. Uh, I, I I couldn't afford it, an academic, but uh, it, it it does. You know, my, we our lab also Maria Blasco's lab have shown that it actually does activate the long race. But um, short of that, like mainly, uh, it's it's long race and telomeres. But the alt is uh, found when you suppress telomerase. So there were telomerase inhibitors, and they actually their number of the New England Journal of Medicine has had a number of phase one, phase two clinical trials. And interestingly, they're not that great. You know, it turns out that many telomerase inhibited cells uh, develop an alternative lengthening of telomeres and the so-called ALT, which is what we find. And I think, I think one of the themes that many themes that Dan pointed out is how um, nature conserves fundamental rules. Uh, many would argue that embryos themselves existed before cancer. You know, there's a very similar metabolism between cancer and cells. They both invade. Uh, and so what, what happens in, uh, in, in these cells that are inhibited, they do this recombination base. So there's a whole industry, you know, sort of scientific uh, field that is looking at this. There's a number of factors. Uh, there's, uh, and ATRX is a gene that is important. All this Z-scan4, actually it, it's converged. Most studies show uh, that the sort of active um, elongation of telomeres that occurs during ALT depend on the two cell genes. So there's convergence of the cancer story in the early development story. Again, uh, that, that they're, they're not, cancers are not wildly innovative. They co-opt uh, things that were developed. So they use these two cell genes. C-Scan4 was the first one. And that, I remember when that came out, there was a fellow called Co. Uh, from Japan that was at NIH, and he did a screen. In the old days, you remember you do these screens where you'd uh, have you know the, the tissue of interest and, not, and then look for uh, differences in expression, and he found a big difference between the two-cell stage and, uh, I'm sorry, between um, uh, the, uh, the these cancers versus not, uh, or the embryonic stem cells that were elongating versus not, was Z-scan4. Uh, and so, they are using the same genes that are um, now how exactly, you know, because right now you see literally a lot of hand waving here, because how we go from those two cell genes to uh, kilobase elongation of telomeres, uh, how much of that is sort of Newtonian linear, you know, like two cell expression causing telomere elongation, which has been shown in both cultured cells and embryos, but then how that then feeds back and that sort of touches on Oliver's question uh, how, how, beyond that, like what happens next? It, it, it's a, probably more like a pas de deux than a billiards uh, you know, match. It's, it's a dance with it that presumably um, arises at a, a, a balance and, uh, and, and probably involving multiple gene, genes being regulated by the telomere position effect, uh, as well as the retrotransposition. So I, I'm sorry, I can't be more precise. Are there any other questions? Just, just so is it too simplistic to think that in the absence of telomerase, long-term reverse transcriptase picks up that role? 
That is, 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 is so let me just repeat that. Um, and as a very, yeah, she has a very uh, perceptive. Uh, how could it be that uh, uh, the absence of telomerase and telomer elongation happening in the uh, absence of active telomerase or telomerase activity, could that be attributed to uh, the 50 to 100 copies of line one, which have a, a, a reverse transcriptase? And it's possible. It's possible. Um, although, uh, it, you know, it, it, the, the kinetics uh, of, of, the, of the telomere uh, elongation are a little hard to explain. You know, the way telomerase works um, is that it, it loads on uh, the lagging strand and it elongates usually to the order of 50 to 100, which is, remember the Okasaka fragments is uh, leaves a kind of a footprint and, and that's where the telomere undergoes attrition. That's where the telomerase. So people have done modeling studies in yeast where you have very quantitative abilities and found it difficult to explain, but yes, it's possible and an important question. Are you going to be with us most of the day, David? Yes. Okay. So, any other but, questions? You can you can uh, you can find the guy who looks like a duck-billed platypus. Um, so now we're going to take.